Ja, go for it. Good morning, uh, everyone. We invite you to take your seats. Uh, I want to say a wonderful welcome to our Lakeshore family, to all our regulars, our visitors, our first timers, everyone who's in the building. You all look uh, so bright and sunny on this almost summer Sunday morning. And uh, all of you who are joining us by internet, you look cool in your sweats and your PJs, I'm sure. And um, also, uh, well, it's a very special morning for the family of Lakeshore because we have the return visit of a very special guest, a beloved person. We'll talk about that later. But uh, that's very special, very nostalgic for us. And um, we even have songs prepared that are his favorites. But um, I was going to say the most important reason that we're here is to exalt the name of Jesus because when the praises go up, the blessings come down. When the praises go up, what? The blessings come down. That's right. So we are looking forward to exalting the name of Jesus and worshiping him because he's worthy. He's a good God who we can trust. So we, turn, we invite you to stand up on your feet now as we turn the worship service over to Bernie and the team. All right. Thank you, Gladys. Let's praise the Lord. Song we're gonna sing, He Lives. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. I love it. Here we go. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know.
standing as we sing Hallelujah. my redeemer lives amen and amen and amen
Hallelujah. Shall we praise the Lord? Yeah. You're not used to that. From, from where I'm coming from, my background, when I say, shall we praise the Lord? And everybody says, praise the Lord. Shall we praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Oh, that is so sweet. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. My Redeemer lives. Wow. Ah, we are so delighted to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, amen, amen, amen. It is a good day. This is the day that the Lord has made. The only thing we can do is to rejoice. Let me say that again. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. That's right, folks. That's the secret. We rejoice and be glad in the Lord. Amen, amen. In, um, in Psalm 33, uh, verse 20 and 22, he said, We put our hope in the Lord. He is our protector and our help. We are glad because of him. We trust his holy name. May his constant love be with us because our hope is in the Lord. I, oh, my mic, why is gone? Yeah, okay, good, good, good. Yeah, my hope is in the Lord, even if my mic would decide not to work. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing with you, I have a hope. <laughs> I know that's the favorite of one person, one particular person here. <laughs> All right, here we go for that. Yeah. 
and he turns it into light. I will yet praise him, my Lord, my God. God, wow, this is amazing to be able to praise him with so much heart and voice. Thank you, worship team, and thank you all for being part of this great worship this morning. And we're not done. We're going to continue. I'm just going to share with you some announcements. And there are some seats left over, Alan, right around here, right? <laughs> praise God. Um, we are having our last Foundations uh, small group happening this coming Wednesday. So if you've been uh, attending and part of that, make sure you don't miss out on uh, Foundations at 7.30 this Wednesday evening. Next Sunday, we will have water baptism. And if anyone here is interested and you haven't yet given me your name, there's still lots of time, lots of room. And uh, we would love to encourage you to come and uh, get baptized in water. So for, that's next Sunday. However, right after the service today, few minutes. I just need to see all the candidates. Anyone interested, if you have questions, you're unsure, we're going to meet in Pastor Rudy's office, in my office, just in the back here. Just make sure you stay and come and see me for a few minutes. I have some uh, instructions to give you. And uh, as well, um, thank you. Yesterday we had a, a plant sale at Audrey's, and I think it went very well. I was not able to go, but my wife went, and a whole bunch of you went, and I hope Audrey, you have no plants left. And uh, you know that we do this as a fundraiser for Operation Christmas Child. We had Joanne Goodwin with us yesterday as well for breakfast. And we had a great time. Uh, the ladies had a great time. Um, this coming Friday, we have uh, not as joyful, but joyful because we know wh where he is. We are having a memorial service for our friend Denver DeGrushi, this will be this coming Friday at 11 right here at Lakeshore. So if you are free and available, just come by. We'll have a, a great time to hear some, uh, just some great stories about Denver. So make sure you show up uh, this coming Friday at 11. And uh, I'll be introducing our special guest that most of you have already noticed. But I won't say his name yet. <laughs> Amen. We're going to have this morning's offering. And... Uh, just so have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to give back. How much you bless us, how much you bless, Lord, this very church. And Father, we ask that you would bless this morning's offering as we give online, as we give through our apps, as we give, Lord, via the envelopes. However we may give, Lord, we do this to support the work that is here. And we thank you for your provisions in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Continuing with our praise and worship. Um, how many of you are here for the first time? Anyone? For the first, first, first time. <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh, our granddaughter. <laughs> oh, Aurelia uh, and her mom's there. Oh, oh, oh thank you. <laughs> Oh my God, that 
is so fantabulous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, as summertime is vacation times coming and, and, and some of us work so hard throughout the year. And actually this day, it was somebody that is so uh, upset because she had planned a vacation time. And then there she heard, there is a special guest coming, Pastor Mary. Our, <laughs> our music director, Alicia. And I know you're watching, Lish. So <laughs> we miss you. God be with you. And uh, continue serving the Lord in that capacity with uh, songs. We're going to sing a, a song that is so vital and important in, in my life. And I know it is for you as well. It's great is thy faithfulness. And it says in Lamentation, his mercy is new every morning. Amen. <laughs> oh, let's just sing. Amen. <laughs> Shine. 
continuing with praise and worship with a beautiful song, indescribable. We cannot describe, we cannot find words to say, to say actually uh, who God is, how magnificent God is. Someone has placed it in a certain way in a song. It always ministers to my heart when I hear it. Indescribable. From the highest of heights to the depths of the Father's love for us. That would be our last song, you know, song and worship. Amen. Oh, it was good to be in the house of the Lord. Father, we thank you. We magnify your holy name, Lord. We come in this fashion with a desire in our heart to worship you and to praise you, Lord. Father, we come with gratitude in our heart. Amen. Because you've blessed us with so much. With so much. At the same time, we take this opportunity, Father, to pray for our community. There are folks in our midst that are experiencing, Lord, great difficulties. You are a God of solution. I'm asking, Lord, you will intervene in their lives. 
We remember right now, Lord, Father, some folks in the special region of Quebec that are going through um, a hardship, Lord. I'm asking that you will be there for them. Enlighten those that are in charge to take the right decision, Father. And Lord, we place the whole world into your hand. There are so many things happening. As it would seem, you're not in control, but we know that you are in control. Father, we ask that through the wars, famine, misery, you will bring healing. You will bring peace. You will bring deliverance for everyone that is going through a hard time. Stir up our heart, Lord, that we stay in communion with you and you alone. Father, be with us this morning and on and on and on. I pray in Jesus' precious name as we sing our last song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Amen. Amen.
Jesús. Quickly, we're going to give you the opportunity to take 95 seconds to 90, not 95, oh, 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 90 seconds, just to say hello to someone that you haven't seen for a while. Thank you. Go for it. Hallelujah. What a wonderful time to do exactly this, to fellowship. If you're watching us online, this is the part you're missing out on. To be able to greet each other, smile, hug, 
Some of you don't hug. That's okay. We still say hello, and we're so thrilled you're here this morning. It is my very uh, big privilege to introduce our guest. Most of you have figured out who it is, and uh, it is uh, just fantastic to have Reverend Mario Sassi and his wife Dorothy here uh, with us, and uh, almost five years to the week that Pastor Mario retired from Lakeshore. So many of you, probably the majority of you, have heard him before. You know him. You love him. And if you don't, we forgive you. But uh, we're so thrilled, Pastor Mario, that you are here with us. Come share with us and take all the time you want. Following, we have time together, a potluck, lunch. You're all invited to stay. But Pastor Mario, take your time. Amen. Amen. Give me a hug. Thank you. Oh my goodness. I am a nervous wreck. And I'm a blubbering mess. Not good. <laughs> Not a good start. I I don't know what to do with all these cameras. <laughs> but it is so good to see all of you. <laughs> My wife is sitting right there. Would you stand so they can see you? to meet your staff online and what a good looking bunch you got and I'm excited for you uh, you have a wonderful pastor yeah. he uh, how long have you been around 30 years and they just found you What an incredible. I'm on a timeline because I understand dessert is being served <laughs> after the service, so we don't want to be late for that. And you can eat all the pot like you like. You never have to have dessert. And you can just leave that if you like. Um, can I do something special just because I I'm just getting a bit of a hum in the in, in thing. Um, I've, we've left here five years ago to the week. Five years ago to the week. And uh, as we've traveled around, I'll fill you in. I'll take three minutes to fill you in uh, instead of telling everybody individually um, what we've been doing. And um, as I've traveled around, you know, there, there's, there's a person that always keeps crying. It feels like I have him in my, in, right behind me in my back pocket. And I think... Did this guy pastor Lakeshore? How does everybody know him? His name is Bernie. <laughs> they don't ask my name. They say, do you know Bernie? <laughs> do you know Bernie? Or who doesn't know Bernie, apparently? Uh, Bernie and Naomi were married how many? How, how many? 11 years ago. So would you mind if I had Bernie and Naomi come right here? And we're going to stand together. Where's Naomi? Okay. Rudy, would you, would you and Roxanne join me? Dorothy, would you come? I want them to come right here. No, I want you to come on top here. <laughs> come, 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 come. And I'd like you to stand with me. Would you do that? Turn around this way. And we're going to pray for this couple. Would you do that? And if you're, 
okay with it, would you take your hand and just lift it out towards us? Would you do that? I won't pray long, but I'm going to pray hard. Amen. Father God, thank you for Bernie and Naomi. Oh, Father, you have blessed them, touched them, anointed them, healed them, strengthened them, walked with them, lifted them up, carried them through. You have been ahead of them, behind them, above them, below them. Lord, you have been in them. Amen. Thank you for their lives. Personally, thank you for their lives. Corporately, thank you for their lives. And in Jesus' name, I bless them. We bless them together as a church for another, oh, more than 11 years. Amen. <laughs> for as long as you give them yes. breath. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray your grace and your strength and your love to just keep pouring and pouring through them to others. In Jesus' name, we pray this together. Amen. And everybody said together. Amen. 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 <laughs> oh, my dear. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. Bless your heart. You may be seated. Oh, you already are. Okay. You okay there? Oh, did I tell you it's really good to see you? <laughs> when I got the call in October, two, uh, in October 1996 to come and be considered as the pastor of Lakeshore, I said to my wife, Pfft. They kind of be scraping the bottom of the barrel <laughs> to come all the way down to London to look for a pastor. I discovered later that they were. <laughs> and uh, we, <laughs> you know, I've been in Montreal a few summers doing doing youth work between college years. And I, I when we got married, I said one place I don't ever want to go back to is Montreal. <laughs> I just don't. And we really, we really, I guess we really put the board through the paces at that time, asking for interviews, making sure they knew what they were getting, because I wasn't sure what I, who I was at that point. I thought I knew. I still don't, actually. <laughs> and uh, the Lord brought us here. And there's something about this city, there's something about this area, but there's mostly something about this church that can't come out of you. It can't. So thank you for tolerating us for 22 years. That was, that was an exercise in patience for you folks. <laughs> Those of you who were here then anyway. So bless your hearts. June 10th, 2018 was my last sermon here. And then we were off five years ago. And Dorothy and I think of you often. We do. We do. You can't spend 22 years pastoring a church and not think of the people that are part of your life, that are, that are part of your journey. Thank you, Pastor Rudy and Roxanne and the board of this church for, for taking a chance and inviting us back. And you all came back out. Wow, that's marvelous. <laughs> And when he first mentioned the possibility four months ago, I thought, that would be great. That, that would be, that put some people back into therapy for a long time. <laughs> but it, it worked out okay. Allow me just about three minutes to give you a quick catch up in terms of uh, what we've been doing for five years since we left here. We have not purchased a rocking chair we have not put our feet up. Uh, nothing wrong with any of those, but we knew what we were leaving Lakeshore for. We just sensed at that time it was time to go. And you know, we may not understand too much of what God does. Uh, at least I don't. You may have it all figured out with God, but I don't. But what, 
we discovered was that his timing is always perfect. And sometimes I look back and I think, you've got to be kidding, God. That timing was not perfect at all. And you almost hear him say, just keep your mouth shut and keep going. Let me take care of what's ahead. And he has. And we finished off, and when COVID hit, I said to myself, thank God I'm not pastoring. But I was. I was involved for 22 months, right through COVID, in a small church. And I'll tell you, it was a challenge. They were all wonderful, godly people. But boy, they all had their own ideas. And so did I. So did I. But you know, God saw everybody through it, including you folks. And it's so good to see. So when we left here, our, I felt in my heart that I wanted to just relieve some pastors of pressures in their lives. I said, look, I'll come and preach for you. I'll come and, and, and assist you. I'll come and set up chairs. I'll do what needs to be done. I'll walk alongside of you. And so things began to open up. And we began ta uh, speaking. And this church then came along, and the district from Eastern Ontario sent me there for two years uh, as an interim pastor. It was quite, 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 quite. The I learned so much about God. I learned so much about people. I learned so much about myself. It wasn't funny. And so there we were. We pastored, and then uh, COVID hit. So I began to write this little daily devotional. And that's how that started, the daily devotional. And I sent it out to the church. And then, of course, other people picked it up. And so that's been part of our daily routine. Uh, then I began to preach in different churches. Now, this, is, this I think is funny. I got a call from a Presbyterian friend of mine. He says, would you like to fill in for me? Wait a minute, you're Presbyterian, I'm Pentecostal. He says, that's okay, they'll forgive you. <laughs> so off, off I went. And it's, it's just incredible what God is doing. In a church that you think was long gone, what, how the people love God. And so there I am in little Presbyterian churches all over north of Ottawa. And you know, you know you're in a little place when your internet doesn't, when it cuts out. And when the toilets only flush when it's raining. <laughs> you know you're in a small church. And it's just been the most wonderful experience. And I, I was telling somebody just the other day, I go right through to the fall every Sunday in these two, three-point charges. So God is making a way. We're, we're, we're enjoying ourselves. We're keeping busy. Um, uh, I work very closely with a funeral home in Ottawa, and, and that gives me much pleasure to meet families, unchurched people. I, before we came yesterday, I met a family preparing for the funeral on Thursday, and I did a funeral, with a and it gives me a chance to minister to people who don't know anything about Jesus, don't know anything about God, and are so open to just hearing about God's love. It's incredible, really. And so I thank God for that. Um, what else have we been And best of all, the move is that we get to enjoy uh, three of our four adult children and uh, two of our four grandchildren that are there. So we, we really enjoy that. We live in a small town called Stittsville. It's on the far west end of Ottawa. And uh, enjoy Point Clare and the West Island because Ottawa doesn't have anything on this, on this city at all. So uh, we're enjoying it, though, because of the people and things we do. All right, that's enough. Here we go. I told you it's really good to see your faces, right? I said that. I have a little funny story that happened to me about th four months. This year, I preached an anniversary. No, it was last year. Last year, I preached an anniversary, 40 years, at a small church that Dorothy and I, actually, it's not small anymore, uh, Dorothy and I started back in London, Ontario in 1982. 
So they had me back for the 25th anniversary while I was pastoring here. And last year, they had me back for the 40th. So here, and, and again, it was just one nostalgic moment after another. And I said to the friend of mine, this Presbyterian friend of mine, I said, oh, I'm going to preach the 40th anniversary of the church we first started at in, in London, Ontario. He looks at me and he says, is it still going? I wasn't sure if that was a backhanded compliment or, or he was saying something. He was shocked that something I was participated in was still viable. <laughs> and he saw the look on my face. And he, said, he tried to explain it. He says, well, well he, he says, half the church I pastored aren't viable anymore. They're, they're closed. Oh, I said, dear God, I hope that doesn't happen where I've been. And there's two reasons that came to mind. Number one is because of God's faithfulness and very tolerant people, number one. And number two, the pastor that followed me there in 1997 is there to this day. Isn't that incredible? So people like this, Rudy and Roxanne, you run, don't run into every day. You just don't. You don't. And I pray to God, we're going to pray after the service, but I pray to God you will love them to bits. And you will hold on to them for as long as God gives them breath and you breath. Amen? I'm amazed daily that God would uh, leave his mission to people like you and me. I really am. I mean, there isn't, a, there isn't a day that I don't go somewhere, whether it's here or somewhere in Ottawa area or wherever else, God opens a door. There isn't a day that I don't pray, God help me not to do too much damage today. Not a day that he would leave his mission to us. Can you imagine? He leaves his mission of loving people to us, to a group called a church. It's incredible. And, and, and even more befuddling to it all is the fact that that's, only, that's the only game plan God has, is you and I. Did you know that? It's all he has. The church is the hope of the world. And he works through you and I. And with all our goof-ups, with all, our, all the stuff we think we're doing right and end up doing wrong, he still works. To me, I don't know about you, but to me, that's incredible. So what I'd like to do this morning, if you have your Bibles, you can go to Luke chapter 4, and we're going to almost walk through it verse by verse. Luke chapter 4, uh, it's going to be on the screen, right? My understanding is, oh, this is fantastic. Not only do you have cameras, i got a screen in front of me. That's absolutely terrific. Great. You could tell. You could tell I'm in the backwoods of northern, north Ottawa. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you a little bit about this, this story here. Jesus, in chapter 3, is baptized, Okay. He's baptized. God confirms his ministry. You know the story in chapter 3. It's almost like his inauguration to ministry, where God says, you are my son, whom I love, and whom I am well pleased. It is you. And then he takes Jesus and leads him into, by the Spirit into the wilderness. And there he spends, Jesus spends 40 days of fasting, prayer, and temptation. I don't know about you, Rudy, but after I was ordained, I did not spend 40, 40 days of temptation, fasting, or praying. And, and maybe I should have. Maybe I should have. It would have been a different start for sure. So with this act of inauguration, God creates a launching pad for the mission he's going to put into place that you and I are a part of, okay? He creates a, a, a launching pad, and he was saying to Satan, the accuser, the one who will never stop bugging you, he says to the, to the accuser, you can do whatever you want, but redemption is coming, and you don't have a hope in the world. Because this Jesus that's coming is nothing like the first Adam who failed. This one is not going to fail. And he launches the program. And then he launches a program with Jesus. 
And then Jesus says, I'm giving it to you. Ha! Right, you've given it to me. Do you know what that means? You have, we have, God's mission statement. I love your mission statement. It says, what's it say? Grow a vibrant community of people that loves God with all their heart. Say it. Mind, soul, strength, and their neighbor as themselves. You can't get a more biblical mission statement than that. It doesn't exist. Because that's what God says we should do. And as we do it, we have the hope and the mission to continue what God is doing. And so he pops it to you. So one thing you and I can count on all the time is that the temptations will never stop. Does anybody here know what temptation is? Okay, so four of us understand temptation. <laughs> the rest of you, terrific. This story we're going to talk about today relates to me. So if it doesn't work for you, you can go downstairs and have potluck. Don't touch the dessert. <laughs> you can do that. Uh, but this relates to me, and I'll tell you how I will draw the parallel. So this story, we're going to read it, has temptation. Jesus is tempted. And each temptation has a parallel for me. You might have different parallels, but we'll see how it works out, all right? So would you stand with me? I'd love to hear you read scripture again. I do this with the Presbyterians, and they almost fell out of their pews. <laughs> and we love reading it together. So here we go, all right? Luke chapter 4. Let's read together. Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I want. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus replied, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then he brought him into Jerusalem and had him stand at the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you on their hands they will lift you up so that you do not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been stated, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until a more opportune time. I want you to read that last statement again. And so when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until a more opportune time. Thank you for reading with me. You may be seated. Lord, bless your word to our hearts and glorify your name. Amen. So this is how the parallels draw out for me. How they draw out for you may be different. But here we go. The first temptation. The devil, after 40 days, says to Jesus, if... You are the Son of God. Tell this stone to become bread. Look at how he frames it. If you are the Son of God. Nothing subtle. If you are the Son of God. Satan appeals to his title. Son of God. Not only meaning you have the power to create, but no, you deserve this. You see, ah, you deserve it. If you're hungry, you deserve to eat. And if you have the power, 
you deserve to use that power so you can eat. You're entitled to eat. Here's my parallel. It's been my experience that it's always dangerous to go around telling yourself what you deserve. Always dangerous to go around telling yourself what you deserve. That's how things go wonky, by the way. You see, people say, I deserve a little splurge. And so you begin to take money, it's not yours. Embezzlement begins to happen. Or someone says, well, you know, I deserve more than what they pay me. That's how you begin to take money that's not yours. I deserve a little more. And so you begin to spend on the credit card and off it goes. Or else you say, I deserve a little escape and pornography begins. Or else I deserve a little happiness and adultery begins. You see, it all starts with I deserve. Think about it. I deserve. Satan, Satan defines sonship as a privilege. He says, if you're the son of God, you deserve this. You're entitled to it. But Jesus didn't. Look at how Jesus defines a son of God by being a servant and his mission. He came to ransom us. Not to be served, but to serve. Big difference. Philippians chapter 2 reminds me that Jesus did not consider it a privilege, even though he was equal with God, his mission was not about what he deserved, but about what others needed. Look, and so how does he respond to Satan? He responds by drawing on the Old Testament in chapter 8 of Deuteronomy. He, this, is, this is God saying to Moses, so he humbled you to the people. He humbled you, allowed you to hunger, fed you with manna, did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make it known that you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus lays down his rights, lays down his entitlement, he becomes the servant. And I ask myself, th here's the parallel for me. Can I remember that? Can I remember that I am a servant, not the CEO? Can I remember that I am with a group of servants and not the chief executive officer who runs things so that people I pastor or people I walk with, they become the people who make my dreams come true. Can I remember that? That's a parallel for me. Maybe not for you. It's not about my rights. It's not about your rights. It's about what God has called us to. Loving him and loving others. You see, the moment I stop around, I stomp around and tell Dorval, these are my rights. I become just like everybody else. The moment I tell people, we're here to serve you. We're here to love you. We're here to humble ourselves to you. Then you become very different. Can we lay down our rights? And I ask myself, I'm... You can take the parallel you want, but for me, I ask myself, can I lay down my rights? And I'll tell you, folks, sometimes it's pretty hard to do that. Can I lay down my rights? Can I give myself, regardless of what others may think I deserve? Let me play it out for you, maybe. I'm a child of God. I don't deserve this. Eh. I follow God. I've done this, I've done that, I've done this other thing. God don't deserve this kind of crud. And when you start talking like that, you're going down the wrong way, in my opinion. Be careful. You know why? Because what I'm talking about is easier said than done. You want to lay down your rights? Try it. Try it. That's one. So temptation to hunger after what we think we deserve. The second temptation Jesus went through was a temptation 
for, well, well, let's read it. It says, I will give, Satan takes them to a high point, shows them all the beauty of the world in a moment. It says, it, it, you know, like a kaleidoscope. Whoa, there it is. You can have it all. I will give you all authority and splendor. It's been given to me, and of course, the first Adam gave it to him. Yeah, he surrendered it all. So Satan was right. It's given to me. I can give it to anyone I want. If you worship me, it'll be all yours. If you worship me, it'll be all yours. Wow. Here's the thing about getting duped, deceived, or being lied to. A liar always puts in some elements of truth in what they're saying or else you wouldn't buy it. You wouldn't buy it. If there was zero truth in a lie, you would never fall for it. But because there are elements of truth, we all fall for it. The first couple relinquished their authority. They gave it away. They took whatever it was they took and decided, we're going to, we know better. And so now Satan has, and he says, all authority is given to me, so I can give it to who I want. If you just kneel and worship me, I'll give you all this. No cross needed. For goodness sake, why would you want to go to the cross for? No pain, no suffering. Satan offers Jesus an alternative path to doing God's work. You can do God's work, not have to suffer, okay? Satan wanted to be the spiritual power broker. Do you see what's happening? He says, look what I can do. And he wants to us to emulate him in being power brokers like him. Look at what we can do. Come to church, you can see what happened. Whoa, yeah. You come to church and you, you, A, you'll have all the money you ever need. You'll have all the power you ever need. You can do whatever you want. It's all good and roses if you just come to church. No, it's not. No. Come to church, things usually get worse. <laughs> Your friends don't begin not to like you? Your family wonders if you lost your rocker? And all these things happen. But look, so, and I'm talking, again, it's personal. I'm talking to my ilk. This is my group of people, my colleagues. We get off on speaking truth to power. Yeah, okay. Speaking Truth to power in God's timing using God's words is one thing. Speaking truth to power in our own words, in our own time, well, that's not smart at all. Not smart at all. I, I have to remember that God still uses the foolish things in life to do his work. He still uses the weak things, the weak people in life. I often wonder, you know, <clears throat> can I tell you this story? I'm going to tell it to you anyway. So. <laughs> when I first started ministry, I, most of you know my background is quite like a mongrel, you know, no pure breed at all. Uh, grew up in Associated Gospel Church, went to Pentecostal Church, went to a Pentecostal College, then I went to a Presbyterian Anglican Lutheran Seminary, and then I finished work at, at the Catholic Seminary, and then I graduated from a Lutheran Seminary. <laughs> so you don't have to be confused, but I'm confused enough. And all, and I, you know, I'd say to God, what, what, am, I, what am I doing this for? I really felt that this is what I should do. My wife, bless her heart, tolerated it. Four kids, I'd be off every Monday going to seminary. And, she, you know, I was wondering, because ministry, it's like this. The more degrees you have, the less money you make. <laughs> so, okay. Then, when I finished here, well, before I finished here, I discovered there were so many people who couldn't believe that this was a Pentecostal church. Maybe some of you still don't. <laughs> I had one gentleman come up to me after the service. He says, with a serious look on his face, like I just scared him. He says, is this a Pentecostal church? I says, yeah, that's what's on the sign on the front. They were disarmed completely 
Why? Because God is God of us, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Catholics, all of them. All of them. God is God. You don't wear a jacket that says, Lakeshore. Well, maybe you do, but that's only a church name. <laughs> you don't wear a jacket that says Pentecostal or uh, Episcopal. No, that's Anglican. You don't wear a jacket like that. Your, your label is child of God. That's what you are. So what happens is that people get all bent out of shape sometimes. And I wonder, I wonder if God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are up there totally shocked with the ministry genius of some of our pastors. And he's, he's looking and he says to Jesus, did, did you know we could do ministry like that? Man, that is fantastic. I didn't know that. Man, she is doing something wonderful down there. We never, how come you never thought of that, Holy Spirit? No, doesn't work. That's not happening. Trust me, it's not happening. Because the goal is to build whose kingdom? You're, whose kingdom? God's. God's kingdom. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, not Pastor Rudy, with all due respect, not me for sure. You see, the longer you have a pastor, the more foibles you understand he has or she has. <laughs> You could quickly discover, oh yeah, he's very human. This is the kingdom of God that's being built. God's work done, I've discovered this. My parallel, God's work done our way always leads to trouble. Whenever I catch myself, this is the way we should do it, no other way, it's trouble. You know you're trouble. Something's happening. Thank God for all people, all the pastors, all the young, old, middle-aged pastors, retired, not-so-retired pastors, who keep plugging away, working for the kingdom of God, and using the opportunity. You know, can I tell you this? God creates an opportunity for you to share your faith every single day. Just watch for it. Watch for it. It's there. Now, if you choose to say, eh, too busy. I don't know what to say. But then that's your problem, not God's problem. God opens the door every single day. And you know, your life is your biggest testimony. Right here. Oh, well, I'm not perfect. Well, join the club. None of us are. Well, you know, I've got mental issues. Well, so do we. Yeah, but I'm not the best talker. Well, nobody is a good talker unless they're all, well, never mind. Do you understand? Every day. God's not looking for how bright or brilliant you are so he can give you the kingdoms of the world. He's looking for your faithfulness. That's all. Are you going to be faithful? Is Lakeshore going to be a faithful witness? Is Lakeshore going to be an obedient witness day after day? No shortcuts, no compromises, no gameship, no gamesmanship. Be careful, beware the desire to belly up to the political power game. You know, for the longest time as a young pastor, um, they'd say, get into, get, get into the Get into the government, you know. Discover who the mayor is. Discover who this is. Discover who the alderman be. Discover who the council And that's all good advice. Not, nothing wrong with that. They're not going to give you the keys to the kingdom. They're not. Be careful when people tell you to belly up to the power brokers. Don't confuse, and I know you would never do this, don't confuse serving yourself with serving God. That's a confusion for me sometimes. That's another parallel. Don't confuse serving yourself with serving God. As in centuries past, the enemy is still tempting people to look, to cozy up to political power. Oh, I know so-and-so, and we drop a name, you know? I know so-and-so, and we drop another name, and we think we're in close with, you know, the whoever it is, the chief, and big deal. Big deal. 
I'd rather hear somebody saying, I'm cozying up to God. I want to cozy up to Jesus. I don't know how many of you, Tim Keller, would know the name Tim Keller, Presbyterian pastor, marvelous man, just died a few weeks ago. And his last words to his sons and wife was this, let me go home. I want to meet my Jesus. I don't want to meet the president. I don't want to meet the prime minister. I don't want to meet the, I want to meet my Jesus. What a testimony. That's the only power you and I will meet. Okay, let's go on. Temptation to hunger after what we think we deserve. Temptation to hunger after political power. Temptation after my own heart's desire. Third one says this. The devil takes Jesus to Jerusalem, takes him to a high point in the temple. This is the same temple that Zechariah prayed in Luke chapter 1. This is where Jesus was presented when he was 40 days old in, chapter two, in Luke chapter 2. And the temple is where Jesus sat with the rabbis teaching them when he was 12 years old. Jesus and Jerusalem were like this, just like this. He wept over this city when he walked into it. Jesus loved Jerusalem. Satan never tempts you with what you don't want. Never. And he says to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he'll command his angels. He quotes Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. He quotes it a bit distorted, but he quotes it anyway. He's got enough truth in there to make it sound right. It's, it's, throw yourself down. His angels will catch you, and nothing will, no, you won't even, you won't even have a foot, your foot won't even touch a stone. He, now, I always thought, why in the heck does Satan tempt him with that? Come on. That's like saying, go up to the top of the lakeshore pinnacle there and jump down. After all, I'm a child of God. I deserve protection, right? I can jump down and I'll just have a nice soft landing. And I thought, why, why does he do that? Well, here's the parallel for me. Jesus was being tempted to do something spiritually spectacular. To show the people I'm the real thing here. Who he really is. I really am the son of God. You see, it is God's plan to bring Jesus to Jerusalem, but not for the spectacular, but for the suffering. Yeah. Jesus tempts Jesus to do something absolutely fantastic, to show these people he is the real deal. And Jesus says to him, what? Don't put the Lord, your God, to the test. What do you mean I can't test God? You can test God. You can ask God. You can have faith in God. But when you try to do it because of a spectacular show, you're in trouble. You've heard this story a million times. I'll tell it to you real quick. A famous pastor from Korea was ministering to thousands. One of his first times. And if you heard the story, don't stop me. And he, as he's preaching, he sees the balcony, and the one-third of the balcony is full of deaf people. And there was a signer doing all sorts of things. And God said to him in his ear, in his heart, he says, call every one of those 300 deaf people. Bring them down here. I'm going to heal every single one of them. Well, this pastor just about croaked right on the spot. He thought, what was that? Not enough breakfast? This can't be God. And he tried to keep preaching. Now, I don't know about you, but when you're public speaking, something's nagging in the back of your head, you've got a real problem because something's liable to come out that hasn't been checked through the brain yet. <laughs> and he keeps going. And finally, he couldn't say anything else until he called these 300 people down. Well, you know, I thought, this is trouble. Every single one of those people came. He did not go into big, he just laid his hands, prayed. Every single one of those 300 came out of that service hearing. Yeah, absolutely. Here's the parallel. Next conference he was in, there was a whole section of deaf people. And he thought, yes. 
follows them all up. They walked up death. They left death. And he was just beside, went to God and said, God, you failed me. He says, no, I didn't. I didn't tell you to do that. You did. You wanted to put on a show. Now you are the show. <laughs> and that's just like us. Just like me. Oh, God, you do it once. You got to do it again. You, you know, you know, Rudy, what it's like. Pressure from everybody and, and, and preachers around you telling me you got to name it and claim it, take it away, take it away. You don't have a million dollars. You got a problem. No. That's not what the Bible says. You see, a church doesn't need connection to powerful people or famous people. A church needs connection to God. You don't need people coming in here who are influencers. We need to hear the influence from the Holy Spirit every single Sunday. You know, for me, personally... It's a marvelous testimony in the last five years to God's faithfulness. I, mean, I was bawling when he said, God, uh, you know, we sang, great is thy faithfulness. I couldn't hold it together if I tried. And then the song, we have a hope, we have a few, bet we do. But you know, it's got nothing to do with us. You know what's the most rewarding time of my life in the past five years? Two things. One, being with people who have absolutely no church background that I meet almost every week, and I sit across from them at a table at a most peculiar private time of their life when they're grieving and get to share with them. Not preach at them, not save them, not... No, just say God loves you. I had one lady say to me, we're not too religious, you know, so we're not interested in hearing too much about God. And I thought, okay. Uh, I said, look, um, you know, I, I stumbled just like that. I said, look, I'm not here to preach to you, but I do, I do need to remind you that God is here everywhere. In fact, he's part of these proceedings right now. She went white. She said, you're right. God is everywhere. But you know what the most beautiful thing, that's the first thing. The second thing is preaching to a group of people that would probably fit in uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, would fit in these two rows. On Sundays. No microphone, no camera. Internet doesn't work. Of course you can't have anything. You, you can't. You're not on TV. And the one time it did work, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> Gone. Being with people who just want to come and hear the Word of God. They don't care how many degrees you have. They don't care how big your church was or how small it was. They care about God more than they ever care about you. They flatter me. They really do. They flatter me. One, one, one search committee said to me, they called me on a Monday after I'd been there on a Sunday, and I said, oh, hello, hello, her name was Elaine. She said, I hope she's not watching. <laughs> hello, Elaine. Alicia, we miss you. <laughs> Calls up in the most Sunday, on a Monday morning and says, oh, by the way, Mary, did you know we had a meeting after the church service? Oh, good. I said, all 20 of you? Yeah, all 20 were here. I said, what'd you do? We elected your pastor. <laughs> I thought that, that, made my month, that made my week, actually. <laughs> that right, you don't know what you're in for. But anyway, um, we don't need that kind of... We need to... Uh, ministering to people like that is the highlight of my life. It is. You know who leads the singing? I do. Do you know who plays the piano? Nobody. <laughs> you know how we sing? A cappella. How many times do we start in the wrong key? Quite often. <laughs> but everybody thinks this is absolutely wonderful. Why? Because they're not there to see me. They're there to hear the word of God. And I got 40 minutes to do the whole service. 40 minutes. You know why? Because I got to jump in the car with my wife and go down the street about 20 kilometers and do another service at another church every Sunday. And I think to myself, this is the cat's meow. This is pretty good. 
Church doesn't need those connections. The only brand you need is Jesus, really. Because Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all people unto me. Jesus is who we want to lift. And last, I'm just about finished. Last verse says this, verse 13. So when the devil had finished every temptation, those three, he left. But it didn't say he quit. It didn't say he gave up. It didn't say he never came back. He said he left until a more opportune time. So get ready. It ain't over yet. He left not for long. But here's our hope in our future. God's victory is on the cross. And the empty tomb is forever. Is forever. So what do we learn from this lesson? Number one, I learned these things. Forget my sense of entitlement and what you think you deserve. The only one, only one person deserves the title to your heart and to your, and to your allegiance. And that his name is Jesus. That's it. Forget what you deserve. Forget what I deserve. Forget about cozying up to powerful people or influencers or... No, forget about that. Major on faithfulness. Major on faithfulness. Something happened to me a few years ago when I read in our denominational periodical these words. Faithfulness and obedience may not be enough in today's ministry. Bonkers. If faithfulness and obedience is not enough, then get out. And folks, I'm telling you, faithfulness and obedience is what the ministry is about. And you know what? We're not just in ministry here or Megan downstairs or anybody else in the board. We're not the only, you, we are all ministers. All of us. Because every day you'll have an opportunity to minister. Thing is, forget about fulfilling your heart's desire your way. Let God give you your heart's desire. The task of us as Christians, followers of Christ, and those who are becoming followers of Christ, and those who are exploring becoming followers of Christ, the task is this, being formed in the image of God. That's it. That's our task. However he wants to work that, he's going to work it in the image of Christ. Lifting up Jesus, we will never go wrong. And God is always with us. Always provide a way out of temptation. Do you have those words, Liz, the last words that you just stuck on? Martin Luther said it this way. I am finished, by the way. Martin Luther put it this way. In a hymn, a mighty fortress is our God. Look at the words. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Jesus. That's it. I'm done. Happy mission, Pastor Rudy, Roxanne. Happy mission here, really. And if you would allow me, I'd love for Dorothy and I to pray with you. Would you allow us to do that? Would you come up here? Are you celebrating an anniversary at all? No, okay. Every year. Every year, excellent. <laughs> I'm more, I like this guy and his wife. Come. Would you stand with me? I didn't ask him if I could do this, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, and we're going to pray together. I'm going to pray for them. We're going to pray for them. We're going to pray together for all of you. And uh, let's trust the Lord together. Would you, mind, would you mind just raising your hands together and saying, Lord, have your way? Father, what a happy occasion. But your work is not done. Your mission is not over. And in many ways, we've just begun. Lord, I pray that you'd pour out your blessings upon Rudy and Roxanne as they lead and walk with your dear people. Pour out your presence and grace and mercy so it flows from them into and out of this congregation and all those who would come here and gather here and all those that they, their lives would touch, oh God. Make us together equal to the task 
of being your disciples, telling everyone what you have done and are doing. We submit ourselves to your constant love and guidance. Fill us with your grace and grant this church your strength, your peace, your direction, your spirit. Keep their eyes fixed on you. And we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And it's time for dessert. <laughs> Bless your hearts. Thank you so much. Great message. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, take